Hi everyone, I'm Brandy and I work here with the Bruce County Public Library in the Walkerton branch and uh, tonight's presentation is called Composting 101. So without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and uh, start this presentation by sharing my screen and we will get started. Okay, so composting 101. This is a recorded presentation. Um, if you have comments uh, you could or questions, you could leave them um, in the comment section of the post and I might have an opportunity to answer some of those questions. Um, and I'll try to offer this again another time and uh, see what kind of interest we get and then maybe we can have a live discussion. So uh, let's get started. <clears throat> First, I am not a perfect composter, I will say that. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about myself. I was trained as a compost educator with the Greater Victoria Compost Education Centre in 2008, and that program consisted of a weekend of training and a 30-hour practicum. And once I completed the program, I became a master composter, which I was quite excited about, and I volunteered with the centre for over three years. In the summer of 2010, my husband and I also completed a permaculture design certificate on Vancouver Island. And permaculture is a very holistic approach to designing sustainable human habitat that meets the needs of people while also harmonizing with the ecology we are living in. Um, and so that's one other thing that I have done some training in. And before my most recent position here with the library, I worked with the municipality of Brockton and I assisted with a number of waste reduction projects um, and sustainability projects with the municipality. And that included creating some of the compost related content on the municipal website and assisting and supporting the environmental advisory committee with several projects and presentations. Um, so some of the information I will share will come from that experience as well. So that gives you a little bit of background about myself. Okay, so we'll dive right in. What uh, is composting? And uh, I had some notes here to ask, you know, what kinds of composters other people are you, each person is using. So, but we're gonna go through those. And um, so what we're gonna do, we'll just gonna dive right in. What is composting? So composting is a natural process that happens within every living organism's life cycle if left undisturbed. And we can speed up this natural process by providing a balance of materials and the right conditions, therefore receiving more of the benefits of composting. So it's really composting is the decomposition of organic material through biochemical processes. And what is compost? It's a little bit of a blurry photo here. I zoomed in on another photo I've used in the presentation, uh, but compost is a as a humus nutrient rich soil like material, which is the result of the biochemical decomposition of organic matter. So it is uh, a natural process that happens, uh, as I said, and this is the material that's left after that natural process of composting. We've got these materials left now. My compost is rarely the um, really beautiful, uh, thick black uh, soil looking um, material. There's always a little bits of leftover eggs and um, husks of different fruit and vegetable peels. Um, but amid, amidst all of that, there's lots of uh, great organic matter. Okay, so why compost? First and foremost, uh, we talk so much about waste reduction and global warming and climate change. So um, again, I'm gonna bring back a few things to the Brockton example. In 2010, a waste audit was conducted in Walkerton and, and that found about 40% of household waste was kitchen and yard waste. So it's quite a large volume. And we know that organic materials placed in an anaerobic environment without oxygen. So that's what happens in the landfill when materials are placed in there, like green organic matter, and then other materials placed on top, plastics, um, so many synthetics especially because they don't break down and they don't allow that um, breeding process. Um, so like most landfills where the environment is 
uh, anaerobic that results in the production of landfill gas. And landfill gas is about equal parts carbon dioxide and methane. And that's a greenhouse gas that traps up to 100 times more heat in our atmosphere than carbon dioxide itself. So by diverting organics, those kitchen and yard waste from our landfill, we avoid producing those methane and methane gases and also reduce the toxic leachate, uh, the volume of toxic leachate that most landfills have to collect and treat. Uh, so as those organic materials break down in a landfill, um, that liquid passes through so much other waste and much of it is toxic. Um, okay, so that's one reason to compost. And then we've got um, organic gardening and farming methods are another reason to compost because composting is a large part of that. So when we take on those organic gardening and farming methods, we farm to feed the soil and we treat the soil as a living organism and a dynamic community with lots of things going on. And we provide good conditions for soil organisms. And the emphasis is on nutrient availability via those soil, soil organisms. And the bottom line is a more sustainable production of quality food for our healthier communities. Then we contrast that with more conventional methods. And the, the goal is to farm uh, or feed the plant versus the soil. And we feed plants directly with more soluble micronutrient chemicals that are um, soil amendments. And uh, the emphasis on the amount of nutrients present in the soil versus the health of the soil. And the bottom line is about the quantity of production and profit, really, when it comes down to conventional farming. Uh, so really, the focusing on the more organic methods, we're looking at the health of the soil and compost is really a huge part of that. Okay. Then we look at some ecological benefits. So compost itself neutralizes the pH of soil. It can neutralize toxins in the soil. Uh, it can loosen clay soil for better drainage, adding those organic material in amongst those um, clay. They're almost like little platelets if you look at the composition of clay soil. Um, it can improve nutrient content and water retention in sandy soil. It boosts biological activity in soil. It, composting increases the nutrient availability to plants through a slow release process and it can suppress soil borne and plant diseases as well. So some social benefits of composting. Uh, we can save money when we compost at home so we aren't going to the soil uh, to the store and purchasing bags of compost or soil. Um, we are doing that right there. We're actually using the waste that we produce on site. We're not driving to a landfill and adding items to a compost heap there and then picking up compost on our way back. That's a savings. Um, as I said, that estimation of 40% of landfill waste being green uh, garden and kitchen waste, eliminating that from the landfill, that 40% or even any amount of that 40% extends the life of the landfill. And if you've done any research um, into how much it costs to uh, create a new landfill, which Brockton and uh, Hanover had to do jointly recently um, in the last number of years. Uh, it's very expensive, very costly to the taxpayer. So any time that we can reduce um, waste going into the landfill, extend the life of it, there's huge savings there. I'll be taking a few drinks as we go along here. Uh, it helps to secure local food supply. So if we're growing healthier, uh, more abundant uh, food and creating um, good soil, then we are securing that local food supply, which is something we're really thinking a lot about these days. It can really also improve your quality of life. So just taking that walk out to your composter and then adding your materials, just seeing that cycle very closed loop in terms of the waste that you produce at home being used again at home. Um, it can be a great, great thing, getting your hands sturdy, all that kind of stuff. If it's something you enjoy, it's pretty rewarding. And it's also, um, it's not, of course, the only solution to our environmental challenges. These days, they're much larger than a lot of our um, impacts that we can make at home. However, it is a part of a proactive environmental solution, which is important to note, and we can do something in our daily lives. Okay. So let's get into a bit more of the how to. So 
So the basic recipe for compost is one part greens or nitrogen rich materials and one part browns or carbon rich materials. And here we can see in this chart um, some do's and don'ts. Um, actually, that, yeah, we'll do that in this slide. Sorry, I'm just checking my notes here. This is an older presentation I've done a number of times, but I spent some time updating it. So um, I'm just getting myself more familiar with it again. So here we go. What to add? Greens or in the nitrogen column on the left here. So we've got fresh fruit and vegetables. So any of those clippings or things that are starting to go bad, those are perfectly good. Fresh grass clippings are very high in nitrogen. Manure from herbivores only, so animals that only eat uh, plants, not other animals. Uh, the manure from those animals is very high in nitrogen. Eggshells are actually quite high in nitrogen. And uh, I mentioned I did my training in Victoria, and in Victoria um, there was a, a soybean processing factory that they plant and they actually produced uh, tofu and so okara um, at least my understanding is that it's a byproduct of tofu production so that is actually something that's very high in nitrogen and the interesting thing about composting often is we want to deal with things that are local so that one is maybe not relevant to uh, Bruce County southwestern Ontario there are probably a few uh, soy processing um, facilities near, you know, within several hours distance, but not like in our backyard like there was in Victoria. But that's kind of an interesting little trivia tidbit. You never know what could be um, close to you. That could be something that you could add to your compost that would be a great amendment. Coffee grounds and tea bags are high in nitrogen and green garden waste. So just those straight up plants and clippings, um, especially in the fall. Uh, anything that's still green, those are going to be a great nitrogen addition. And again, we're, we're wanting to keep an equal sort of amount of greens and browns. So browns are those carbon rich materials that would include dry leaves, sawdust of untreated wood. So you wouldn't want any pressure treated wood um, because it's treated to not break down. And also you don't necessarily want those um, chemicals that are used to treat that wood mix in with your compost especially if you're planning to do um, vegetable uh, growing hay and straw are very rich in carbon as a brown material you can think of a lot of things that are woody and dry those are really brown and carbon rich newspaper is another uh, carbon brown material wood ash in small amounts can be a good addition uh, cardboard that's on wax can be something that you would use if you have it and you want to beef up that carbon in your compost and any woody debris again very carbon rich so things not to add uh, would include meat fish and bones um, and again these are some you know general rules most backyard compost bins you'll want to avoid adding these things to um, dairy any oily or greasy foods, breads and grains. So anything that's been cooked or highly processed isn't always ideal. Of course, any diseased plants, you would want to avoid that because there would be potential then of spreading that disease to other future plants. Noxious weeds, uh, noxious weeds, first of all, they can often spread really easily. And secondly, they can sometimes um, burn skin and that kind of thing. So avoiding putting those in means that you won't have to deal with that as a future problem. And then uh, the opposite of the herbivore manure, any meat eating animals, you would want to avoid that manure. So that would also include some of our common household pets as they're often eating meat products. <clears throat> And the reason we have a lot of these do not adds in um, that column is because these often attract pests. And so if you have trouble with skunks, raccoons, and Victoria is more issues of rats actually, um, but those can be problems here, squirrels perhaps. If you have problem, problems with those in your yard, then you probably want to avoid a lot of these things. Not to say that the, the fruits and vegetables wouldn't be things that they would go for, or maybe even licking out the eggshells, that kind of thing. But these other items are really going to be things that would attract pests. Um, but I don't feel that composting should have a lot of rules. I feel like it should be pretty relaxed. I'm a pretty relaxed composter. So 
I add all of these things into my black compost bin that sits in my backyard. I have not had many problems that I've, you know, not been able to deal with. Um, so it's really up to you. All of these things break down, of course. Our ancestors have always put these things in um, uh, their compost heaps and piles and, and rubbish piles. So they eventually break down. Um, so yeah, in small portions, you're really not gonna have a problem. If you're dealing with large volume, then you might wanna look at a different solution. Okay. Um, and then the exception to some of these things are the green cone digesters, but we will talk about that in a few moments. So talking a little bit more about carbon to nitrogen ratios, uh, this is a table taken from a really great book called Gaia's Garden by Toby Hemingway. And that's table 4.1, carbon to nitrogen ratios in common mulch and compost materials. So these are things that you might have in a larger volume. And um, it tells us a little bit about how we can um, create a more ideal ratio of that one to one ratio. So in reality, each organic material has a carbon to nitrogen ratio, which is an uh, inert to that material. So for example, sawdust, which we see over here, has a carbon to nitrogen ratio for softwood of 600 to one, while cow manure has a carbon to nitrogen ratio of 18 to one. So where are we here? manure cow up, up here. So uh, there is far more carbon uh, inert to sawdust than there is to cow manure. So it's really higher in nitrogen that manure as we talked about. So when we use the basic recipe, we're actually trying to aim for a carbon to nitrogen ratio of 25 to 30 to one. Um, and let's see here. So looking at hay and uh, manure, those are things that you can, if you think about it, um, sorry, mature alfalfa, they're a little bit wordy, woody and a little bit green. So they have a really nice ratio there that um, if you just use those, they would probably break down pretty nicely. Um, but then when we've got things like maybe you've had some trees chopped down on your property and you've got piles of sawdust that you don't want to use as mulch, you want to compost it. Well, you are going to have to offset that with some very high nitrogen materials to really get a good balance so that things will um, decompose properly. You'll see here the human urine is in there. Uh, that's a pretty, a pretty interesting one. Some people will add that to um, different composts. I'm not necessarily making that as a recommendation, but it's there as a point of interest. Um, so that, like I said, the proper balance of browns and greens or carbon to nitrogen is important for a few reasons. First, it ensures that the compost uh, finished compost product has nutrients available for plants that will be released slowly. So compost too high in nitrogen can burn plants and compost too high um, in carbon can lock up that nitrogen in your soil and make it unavailable to plants. And then the carbon component in your compost bin is also helps to keep smells, flies and pests away by absorbing those food smells and ammonia gas that might be produced by the breakdown of nitrogen rich materials. The carbon component also helps to ensure that lots of air pockets are in the compost. So that woody debris and straw, for example, they kind of bulk things up, allowing for more air in the compost pile, which deters the production of methane and ammonia, and it encourages that biodiversity among the physical decomposers, um, things like the little bugs and worms. And this balance helps to speed up that decomposition process. So that's really why we're looking for that, um, as we said, 25 or 30 to one um, carbon nitrogen ratio for each of those items, but kind of a one to one of browns and greens when we look at volume. Okay, so some composting essentials. We talked about the carbon nitrogen ratio, that's important. So thinking about green, um, moist, um, really sort of like, Anything that would wilt easily, that's going to be really high in uh, nitrogen, along with those manures and other things. Uh, carbon is, like we said, leaves, things that are woody and a bit more dry, right? So mix those together in a nice combination and you've got a good start. The surface area of materials. So 
The size of the materials determines how quickly or how slowly you will have finished compost. So if you cut up your food and yard waste as small as you can, so for example, chop up melon rinds or banana peels, um, even into smaller pieces than just your, your larger pieces that you would normally throw into your compost uh, bin. Um, you crush your eggshells, trim up your garden clippings and twigs into smaller pieces. Lots of people will do that as well. I'm a kind of chop and drop mulcher where if, no, if nothing is diseased, I will simply start from the top of the plant, work my way down and chop it into little bits and let it fall where it may right in the garden. And then it mulches right in with everything. So those tiny pieces really break down more quickly. So you've got a larger surface area um, for those physical decomposers, the other insects and worms to really get in there and the bacteria to do their work. Um, things you could also do are to like chop up leaves or dried grass uh, with your mower again to get it even smaller. So then the size of the compost bin itself is important, the size of the composter. So the ideal size is about one cubic meter or kind of a cubic yard. And if it's too big, it's hard for air to circulate amongst the material and get enough air going in there to get an aerobic um, decomposition process with enough air. And if it's too small, it's hard for it to get uh, to heat up. And you want um, the compost to be able to hold some heat to attract the bacteria and other um, insects that are going to work away there. Moisture. So you want it to feel as wet as a run out sponge or to kind of have that look to it. If it's too wet and soppy for some reason, if the lid comes off your composter and you get a huge downpour of rain on top, um, that's going to be hard for anything to really uh, move along quickly and decompose easily until you get it dried out a bit. So mixing browns into that will help dry it out. Um, so you really do um, want to keep that um, idea of that ratio in mind because if it's too wet, add some browns. If it's too dry, get some greens in there or spray it with water to kind of keep it to that wrung out sponge um, feeling of that amount of moisture. So air is another important component. We want to turn or poke our um, compost pile or things in our compost bin often to keep some uh, air circulating there as things break down and settle they kind of those air pockets um, are filled up with material so uh, in this photo this illustration we've got something here called a wing digger and uh, it's something that's sold you do not have to purchase this but it, it shows you um, just a sort of an idea of aeration so uh, this little spot here where the wings are attached uh, these move up and down so as you push this gardening tool into your compost pile it makes a small hole and then as you pull it up the wings flap out and then the hole is larger uh, so you can really get a lot of air and aeration in there the other thing that it's great for is if you have a black compost bin and you try to turn things with a shovel or a pitchfork you end up kind of pressing against the sides because you're trying to get some leverage to turn the pile or turn part of the pile in the compost bin and the older plastic bins especially can become brittle and you end up breaking the the lip of them on the top so using something like this wing digger which i don't have um, i often just use a large stick just to poke some holes in there stir things around or try to be gentle with a smaller tool than a shovel but sometimes I get in there with a shovel. Like I said, I don't like too many rules, but this is um, a tool that you might be interested in or make it a little easier for you. It's physically a little bit easier to use than a shovel to turn things because it gets that air in there and it really, you want those aerobic, not um, anaerobic conditions, lots of air. And then that diversity of materials is actually really important. So you want a variety of materials that will provide a finished compost that is more complex. And the more nutrients that you add to the pile, with that diversity of materials, will make for a finished compost that will grow healthier plants with more vigor as well. Okay, next slide. The other thing that we can talk about when it comes to compost is something called dynamic accumulators and activators. So dynamic accumulators are plants that mine nutrients from the soil through their roots and make those nutrients available via their leaves. So examples include borage, 
uh, yarrow, comfrey, mint, lemon balm, nettle, marigold, and dandelion. So those leaves, um, if you chop the base of those plants when they're starting to mature and they've got a good amount of leaves there, you just simply add those to the compost and they are going to add some of those nutrients that they have mined through the so um, from the soil and their roots. Um, you're going to be adding those into your compost. And um, if these are these are perennials, uh, most of these marigolds, not often. Um, you can let it regrow throughout the season and cut it. You can sort of let it regrow and cut back and add to your compost as often as you can. And then those activators. So those are added to the compost bin to accelerate the decomposition process. Um, so adding a couple of shovelfuls of finished compost to a new compost pile, or you've added a whole bunch of yard and vegetable waste uh, to a fresh bin, or you've emptied a bin and you're getting it started, filled up again, adding some fresh compost in there will have we'll be full of that uh, bacteria and other organisms that are important to the decomposition process. So that's a great activator. Uh, nettles are a very good activator. Manure is a great activator if you think about it. But manure, like everything, once um, it sort of dies or is harvested, it, it starts to decompose. So the manure is um, just like it's just full of all of that amazing stuff that's going to bacteria and other little microbes that are going to get um, that process going. So grass clippings, uh, again, high nitri nitrogen, they're going to really bump things up. Comfrey. Okara, we talked about earlier, is that byproduct of the tofu production. Um, that is apparently a great activator. And then again, a bit of a, a seaside uh, plug here. <laughs> we are not anywhere close to the ocean. However, you may have access to or want to add, depending on your soil, um, some seaweed or kelp extract. So those were things that we could easily um, acquire next to the ocean. So. So those activators really promote that biological activity, which increases fertility of the soil through that humus formation and the aeration and the moisture retention. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the science. And this is where I really rely on my notes a bit. Um, this is not the kind of language I speak every day, so I will do my best and walk you through it. So composting science 101, the life cycle of a compost pile. Stage one, the bacterial and fungus stage. In this stage, the browns and greens start to be broken down chemically by bacteria. Nitrogen is broken down into chains of amino acids and carbon is broken down into carbohydrates. While this chemical breakdown is occurring, heat is being released and the heat of the compost pile creates ideal short-term habitats for more heat-loving bacteria, the thermophiles, which are able to break down chemical bonds more quickly. So this is why active composting gets you finished compost uh, much more quickly because of that heat um, and that attra attracting those thermophiles, which are do that great job of breaking down those chemical bonds. And then fungus or molds help to break down, uh, helps the bacteria to break down the carbon and nitrogen components by attacking the cellulose in the plant and breaking it down. Okay, so the bacteria and the fungus have gotten in there, done all their great stuff. Stage two, earthworm stage. Once the pile has cooled down a bit from its chemical decomposition process, so all that heat is created um, from the bacteria in the fungal stage, uh, earthworms and other physical decomposers, I often see um, sow bugs or potato beetles, some people call them, uh, in my compost, uh, they come and find it. Once it's ready for them and on an ideal stage for them, they find it. And they take in that pre-digested material and mix it up to form that humus rich uh, the anions or positively charged particles, uh, which act as nutrient sponges for negatively charged cation elements. So those are some of the physical science things that are happening at this stage with the earthworm stage. Stage three, stage of ripeness. It's like a fine cheese. Um, so it's like that maturing of a fine wine or fine cheese and the compost is a Finished compost is dark and crumbly with a great balance of macro and micronutrients, and it's often called black gold, and you'll know by how beautiful it looks. I said earlier that I don't always get to that stage, probably because, again, I don't like a lot of rules around composting, and I have young kids, and I don't always get to um, manage my compost as uh, 
perfectly as I might. So it probably starts to dry out a bit by the time I'm ready to use it, which makes it look a little bit browner than some of that really rich compost. I probably missed the like really super ideal stage, but it's still adding a lot of great amendments to the soil. But that stage of ripeness, the beautiful black looking sort of compost or soil, that's what you're going for. We all have goals, right? Okay, so now we can start talking about some composting methods. So two main uh, methods, passive or cold methods. So those are mostly suitable for backyard compost. They're very low maintenance and you add layers of material as they're available. We take out our compost bucket from the kitchen a couple of times a week. We don't add a lot of other garden material unless we need to, but we will, you know, if we pull some grass out of a, a garden bed that we don't want there, we will add that to the compost. Um, we add things as we need to. Those are passive and cold compost because it's just sitting there breaking down. Um, but that active compost is, or hot compost is called, is suitable for larger scale backyard gardeners. So you want a large volume of compost in a shorter period of time. Uh, an active compost is, is one way to go. So, um, and actually, I'm just going to back up here a little bit, back to my notes on the passive or cold composting. So really, it's just a simple way to reduce and recycle organic debris from your um, household yard. And um, because it's simple, that's a real pro, a real advantage. The disadvantage is that it can take a long time, so six months to two years to completely break everything down and to reach that finished compost stage. And the cooler temperatures don't always kill unwanted plant seeds um, or neutralize noxious plants or pathogens. So something to consider. That's why we would avoid putting those in. Um, that active or hot compost, as I said, is a batch process of rapid decomposition that takes place at high temperatures. So what you do is you basically layer uh, greens and browns in a very large volume. You would fill about a meter square, a yard plus square, of material in these layers with perfect amount, not perfect, but ideal amounts of moisture, um, warm time of the year, and everything would start working all at once. You create the perfect conditions for composting. And um, because it's a large volume, it's going to heat up really quickly and it goes through the stages of composting rather quickly. So it allows for that a very fast production of compost with and they're well managed piles. So they're high maintenance as uh, the second point notes here. And um, it gets to the decomposition stage or the ripened stage about eight to 15 weeks. So it's quite quick. Um, and so if you have a goal to suppress plant disease or kill weed seeds, you would need to closely monitor that pile to ensure it reaches a temperature ranging between 40 and 60 degrees Celsius. Okay. And if you have a specific seed that you're looking to eradicate, uh, I would look that up to see if there's any information online about what temperature you would be aiming for. And you would use a very large thermometer uh, with a probe to measure that temperature uh, throughout the day, perhaps, um, or daily, just to make sure you're reaching those temperatures. Because you may need to add more moisture or um, other materials. So the advantage is that it creates a large amount of compost rather quickly. Um, the disadvantage is that it's labor intensive, so you need to collect all those materials and that volume. Um, the bin size can be difficult for some people to sort of achieve or get enough material. And um, just like finding all that material can be difficult, but you can compost a very large amount of material at once. So two different compost uh, methods, passive or cold composting, active or hot composting. Composting systems. So we're going to go through a number of them here. These are uh, two different photo uh, illustrations, photos of backyard bins. So the one on the right here, the, the black sort of earth machine style, many municipalities over the last 20, 25 years have um, invested in these and resold them to residents as a way to encourage composting. So a lot of backyards have these. Maybe you inherited it when you purchased a house. Um, I know I did, I inherited two of them. And um, they're great because they don't take up a lot of space. There, uh, you harvest, uh, put things in through the lid, it's a locking lid. Um, for the most part, these are pest resistant, but there are some um, 
spots where they can get their teeth around. I have some chew marks in some odd places um, in the bin that on the bin that we have in our backyard. But you lift this up and uh, you take out your finished compost from the bottom. There are two on our property. One is one that's always kind of working and breaking down. It's full and the other one's the one we're actively adding things to. It's kind of a nice uh, system. Uh, and we use some cinder blocks in front of these. Um, ours does not have a base plate. Usually they have a big round base plate that fits in the bottom here that's screwed into and that keeps um, some pests out. But we've had a few problems, nothing serious. We have a lot of squirrels. Um, but we just use some cinder blocks to block it off and make sure that no one can get into it. But these are really easy, um, easy to use. So the um, great for small scale backyard home composting, the town of Sogging Shores has them for sale for $40 right now. So that's one place that you could get them. Uh, the three bin uh, pallet composter. So these are plans from um, uh, the Compost Education Center site, they have some great plans. These are simply using pallets, um, some fencing, rebar, uh, hardware cloth. So you would never want something, uh, the holes in these to be any larger than, um, I'm gonna say, I think it's half a centimeter. I could be wrong, I think we get to that later, but it's lined with this like fine mesh, not too fine, but fine enough that uh, most rodents wouldn't be able to chew through it or squeeze in. Um, and you can just, maybe one bin has all of your brown leaves in the fall, so you can add them to an active bin. Maybe this bin is full and you have, uh, you just let it sit for the season and then you fill this one up for the season. If you've got a lot of yard waste uh, or you want to sort of add quite a volume of say manure or I don't know, maybe you do a lot of canning and have a lot of fruit and vegetable waste throughout the summer. Uh, most earth machines could handle that, but maybe you just have larger volume um, and you want to uh, build, a three, build a three bin system. There are so many compost uh, pallets that you can access for free. Uh, this could be a really great option. Okay, and you could also, this would be, a, one of these would be a good size for a hot compost bin if you wanted to try that. Okay, tumblers. So this system is a vessel and it promotes the aerobic decomposition process. So some advantages are that it's an ideal system for people with limited access to yard space or people living with certain physical limitations. So it only handles a small amount of material and it can be a bit more pest resistant in that it's up off the ground. Uh, disadvantages can be that they're more expensive than other systems. And uh, although you can make your own with large um, barrels, uh, larger models can be difficult to turn one full. So that's something to really consider, especially if you do have physical, uh, if someone has physical limitations, it, it may not be as ideal as you think. Um, it doesn't have contact with the soil, which kind of prevent that exchange of some beneficial microorganisms and limit some biodiversity in your finished product, just because it doesn't have that contact on the ground. Uh, fruit pie populations can be a bit greater in these backyard composters just because the materials are all mixed together and, and these would all be sort of vents and flies could get in and out of them more easily. Um, and, you know, because you everything's all mixed around, um, some of those fruits and vegetables would be kind of open to the air versus in a, another bin you would probably have that covered with a brown layer just to um, keep those kind of flies down. And um, it's constantly mixed together in these kinds of tumblers. So um, you might want to have one that you could let sit and get to that final stage of ripeness instead of having, you know, some ripe things mixed in with freshly um, added things because you're not going to get that finished compost as quickly when you're kind of constantly adding new stuff and mixing it together versus having it settle in layers. Um, but uh, so you may want to have a second one that would allow you to have one that ripens and one that you're adding things to. And you can, you can find plans for these online as well. Okay, um, green cone digesters. So this is another kind of composting system. So it's a mix of aerobic and anaerobic decomposition. And it has a, a double walled bin, which is kind of shown here in this illustration. So there's a, a small cone inside and this other one um, that 
is on the outside and there's an air pocket in there really between the two layers um, it is dug into the ground so you want to dig it um, into at least past this seam because um, different uh, pests could definitely chew this seam you want it to be dug into the ground as they show here with this illustration and this one you can see is dug quite low um, and what happens is that the uh, here it's saying solar powered food waste digester so the sun's rays hit that green cone uh, because of that layer of air in there between the two different layers of plastic it does begin to heat up and it creates um, a really ideal place for that digestion to occur so it creates a really nutrient rich leachate and about 90% of the waste is turned into liquid. So it kind of almost vaporizes everything um, and it's absorbed, that leachate's absorbed by the surrounding soil. So it's ideal for a family that wants to divert waste and not harvest finished compost. Um, I say family only because I know I've got young children. I can throw um, any food waste. Maybe there's a bit of meat and bread and cooked grains and uh, vegetables and ketchup there's always ketchup <laughs> um, all into that bin at once and it doesn't really matter because uh, pests really can't get into this very easily and um, it's sort of a throw it in forget it kind of system um, and it's especially those like we say hard to manage kind of food waste and um, it can also compost pet waste so you must locate the digester at least 10 meters away from any food bearing crops if you are going to be adding pet waste to this uh, system the other thing is that's really important to note is that it must be placed in a sunny location with good soil drainage if it is not it will not work efficiently and you will fill it up and you will be frustrated um, i've done this mostly probably because i have added um, uh, other large volumes of food waste that I'm trying to think of what it might be like a piece of meat that goes bad or a chicken carcass or maybe like cleaning out the fridge every couple of weeks and you have this sort of material that you're adding in there and it's not a mix of things right so but if you don't have this in a warm spot with lots of sun uh, it will not work very well um, it really is a bit of a lower volume system and um, you need that heat so if you have it in a shady spot and you're not happy with it reconsider moving it i would suggest um, a lot of our front lawns are the sunny places on our property you know consider moving it there and being proud of your composting efforts and the things you're doing for the environment um, because you need a sunny location for this to work and uh, otherwise it will just be slow and it will fill up as i say um, you consider consider could consider adding those harvested accelerators like we talked about um, different leaves of of nettle or borage um, and see what happens the um, and there are commercially available bacteria packets and you could add warm water and kind of get that going and some of the municipalities um, do sell these uh, one other thing that I would mention is that I do often, if I use these in the past, I would use a large stick to sort of tamp down the food and get rid of some of those air pockets um, just to get more in there. But that also may be some of the problems that I had. There wasn't enough of the aerobic um, decomposition happening. I'm not sure. I haven't, haven't perfected the digester myself. Um, however, there are several municipalities that do sell these, so these could be a good option, maybe just for the food waste that you don't want to add to your other compost systems. So Brockton, South Bruce Peninsula, Kincard, and Sogging Shores, and Huron Kinloss have these for sale, so they could be worthwhile checking out. So this was our first uh, green cone in our first on our first property in Walkerton, and uh, I think we had two before we moved, and we definitely filled them, but our backyard was shady. Okay, another composting system that we can consider is the uh, vermicomposting with worm bins. So um, I have vermicomposted in the past. I'm, I don't do it now because I'm not as good at looking after my children and worms at the same time. Um, when we moved most recently, uh, there wasn't a place for the worms. They were in the garage and they were neglected. So um, 
I, I don't have worms currently, but I would like to go back to it someday. So this is an indoor composting method for small volumes. And it's ideal for people in condos or apartments, and it's really fun for kids. So this is a picture of, um, I would go to the, my children's class or daycare um, class and take the worm bin and do a whole little session with them. And, and they thought it was quite fun. This is from the Brockton Child Care Center a number of years ago. Um, so you need a ventilated bin or bucket. So it's very easy to make these um, yourselves. Here are some, I think these are soffit uh, vents with some, uh, screen door screening uh, just to keep fruit flies out, although that doesn't really keep them out. They're still quite small, but it would keep your worms from escaping. Um, and a tray in the bottom to collect any leachate that comes out and then something to turn it with. And then you've got a nice lid here to keep things closed. Um, so really what you do is you, you get the bin. You need red regular worms. They are the only kind of worms that will work for this composting system. They are super efficient eaters and um, they uh, create a lot of poop, which is what your final compost is. So they're um, very, very efficient. I said you create bedding, which is often out of shredded newspaper, or other carbon rich material for the worms to live in. And then you feed the worms your food scraps. And in about four to five months, you can harvest their nutrient rich castings, which is their poop. And you can harvest worm teeth liquid for the plants as well, uh, depending on um, how often you harvest that. And here's something called, um, I don't have the name for it, but it's like a worm tower. I, I have one of these as well. Um, I really liked it for worm composting. It's very compact. Um, and then you simply uh, you keep sort of your oldest bins here on the bottom and it's it's rotting down and working away. Everything else kind of still filters through that. Uh, but the worms can freely move between these different trays and uh, your most recent material that you're adding is up here on the top and uh, it has a big tray on the bottom that collects the liquid. Um, it's a great product actually, I really enjoyed using that. It's uh, the disadvantages of this type of composting, it's quite fun, it's quite enjoyable. I know of a number of people locally who have done it in the past, I'm not sure if they're still composting this way. Um, it can be a bit time int um, intensive, so depending on your stage of life, your situation, it, it may not work. Um, other pests can be a problem. I've had problems with fruit flies. That's because, again, I'm not a perfect composter. I don't like rules and I tend to overfeed my bins like when I'm going on vacation or I've got things left from my canning. I can kind of I sort of neglect the worms and I would overfeed them. So those are things to avoid, but it happens. Um, and then worms are essentially raw vegan. So not all materials can be composted uh, in this type of a bin. And um, honestly, I was most successful before I had children when I had composted with these worms. One life wasn't as busy. Thank you, I needed a little drink break there. Okay, next type of composting. Sheet mulching is another one. Sorry, I have a little lozenge in here. It's a bit dry. Uh, so hopefully you can't hear it too much. Um, you can Google something called bomb proof sheet mulching. And uh, what you do is basically create a soil or compost in a large area with a large volume. So for large degraded areas or areas of your lawn, you want to turn into garden. And uh, the reference that I use is from the guy's garden uh, book by Toby Hemingway. He's a great recipe for bomb proof sheet mulch, but um, it's been a few years since I've Googled it. I'm sure there are very um, a lot more uh, videos and uh, references online now. So take a look at that. Uh, essentially, you are layering greens and browns. In this case, we used, um, if I go back, um, a bit of soil, straw, manure, and we layered that over cardboard. We soaked all of the layers and we um, finish it off with leaves and this these were little keyhole beds in our first backyard they were a little bit messy they worked okay but it was one of our first it was our first property that we had sort of free reign in uh, our garden we experimented with a few things um so we'll do a couple of the first thing you want to do is slash and cut the grasses and the plants in the area so this is an um, 
our next house and yard where we did this at the back property line. Uh, you soak that area, the soil and the grass very well with water. You lay down cardboard, going to the recycling depot is a great way to get those items. And you overlap the edges, you soak the cardboard. Some people say to perforate it a bit. I've never had problems, problems with that. You soak it thoroughly. Then you add layers of greens and browns and you soak that. This was a bit of um, rotted straw, I believe. And you can add then a final layer of mulch and wood chips. And really it's kind of, um, it's really just creating a great layer of mulch and getting rid of those grasses and other um, plant that you don't want to have growing in, say, a flower garden. So it's just another different uh, form of composting. Okay, that's just a picture of some molding rotted straw because who doesn't love looking at that? But that's what we used. Um, that's what we had. So uh, that's what we used. I think I gathered some bales from people who were using. Um, straw as fall decor on um, their front lawns or their porches and that's a great um, find for a carbon rich material and hmm my picture is not showing up here but we covered it with some free wood chips if you see people out cutting trees they often have to mulch a lot of the smaller branches um, if you give them your address uh, sometimes the list can be a bit long but if you give them your address they um, will eventually come and drop off mulch to you so free mulch can be found. Trenching is another one that I've used in the past. These are raised garden beds at our previous property. And um, ooh, I'm not sure how tall the beds were. They were probably 12 inch boards, I think. So nice deep beds. And um, basically what you're doing with trenching is you're burying your food scraps, uh, including all of those no-nos um, in your garden about 40 centimeters deep, uh, about 16 inches, and you cover that with your topsoil. So trenching utilize, utilizes anaerobic decomposition to create an underground band of nutrient-rich humus for our plant, for your plants where they need it most, right at the root zone. Okay, so we'll just go through a little bit of how to with just some photos because I find that can be very helpful. So here's a big pile of compost, uh, sort of like a stainless catering bin. Here's another a leftover container that has some compost in it. Uh, not comp, but it's vegetable scraps, I should say, kitchen waste. So dig that hole 16 inches, 40 centimeters deep to bury your food scraps. Add the food scraps. And then what I would do, because these are very large pieces, remember we talked about um, reducing the surface area of each piece. So I would actually get in there with the spade and chop up those pieces to be even smaller and just kind of go at it. And then I would turn it in with the soil just to really cover everything. Um, if you think about having an entire apple core sitting there, that is far more attractive to a pest than tiny bits of apple all stirred up with soil. So the more that you can get things into small bits and mix it up, uh, the less interesting it is to those pests. Um, then you are going to add carbon rich material, rotting straw or leaves right to this, um, excuse me one moment, getting some notifications on another app. Um, you're going to add that carbon rich material to your trench and then cover with that deep layer of soil. Okay, and then your final step is to um, cover it with that other carbon rich mulching material. So here we had straw that we had covered um, our garden beds with. Okay. And um, so this is just a little pullback of the straw and a little dig in. You can see the previously trenched material. Um, it's all but composted and only the eggshells remain. So that is pretty efficient. And uh, the squirrels at that property were constantly hiding walnuts on us. And well, let's just call that natural aeration. We work with nature and um, there it is. <laughs> so work, work with those pests. 
which comes to our next slide. So here's a, uh, a picture of the compost bins on campus at Harvard University, a Flickr um, photo that I found online, and uh, there's a squirrel just hopping right out of there because it probably just had a nice big feed. So we can never 100% ensure that you will never have a problem with pests. Um, a mismanaged compost pile may attract many pests, um, but here's how to manage your compost. So first, location, location, location. Think like a pest, squirrel, raccoon, etc. You want to live somewhere where you can have shelter, food, and be protected from your predators, somewhere cozy to hang out. Uh, so then when you set up your compost, it's best to keep it in a more open location. So often we think about tucking them in the back corner of our property, and that's really ideal for pests. Um, so um, it deters pests and you can get some direct sunshine instead of in that back shady spot, which is going to speed up your compost process as well. Um, and you want to locate it away from trees and fences and buildings, if at all possible, and make the location of your bin as unattractive to pets as possible. So I heard that someone put it between their garage and their house and they just kicked that bin every time they went past. No one wants to live in a bin where that's happening. So, you know, think outside the box. How can you make it least attractive? Um, the second thing you want to do, which we talked a little bit about before I mentioned before, is keep a carbon or brown layer on top of your compost. So it will absorb the food scrap orders and facilitate a balanced breakdown that will not really be smelly or attractive to animals. Third, Make sure that your bin has a very heavy or locking lid and base plate. So we talked about that earlier, um, some sort of thing that keeps them from digging underneath and coming up into the compost as well. Um, if pests are hungry, they will be persistent. Um, so this will encourage, uh, discourage the animals if you've got a lid that's locking, maybe a big rock on top, whatever you need to do to keep things secure. And the base plate uh, should not have holes larger than half an inch. Um, about 1.25 centimeters and should not be easy to dig under. And um, so, yes, we don't want to have those holes any bigger than half an inch or one and a quarter centimeters. Um, aeration. Aeration is very um, important because, again, it helps to get that decomposition process going. Uh, the more that you've got things decomposing quickly, the fewer um, pests are going to be attracted to it. And um, it's also disturbed and no one wants to live in a disturbed pile that's constantly stirred up. And um, it also covers, like we said, those bits of, of vegetable and food waste, covers it in soil, and that's just less attractive to um, a pest. Then adding those things that we talked about, the no-nos, if you're having trouble with pests, just stop adding them at all. The mesh, the meat to fish, um, bones, dairy grains, cooked or oily foods, those are going to be attractive. So just keep them out. Um, but just, you know, if you if you think adding a little bit is working, keep on with that. That's fine. All right, managing unwanted plants. So I wrestle with the term weed because I keep hearing just how healthy plants such as dandelions, burdock and get weed actually are for us to eat. And um, and they're also healthy to add to our compost. So I prefer the term unwanted plants versus weeding weeds. Um, so here we go uh, with weeding or plant removal. Timing is everything. Ideally, you will hold your guard and every 10 days to ensure that they are weed free. And if you can catch unwanted plants before they go to seeds, then you're uh, laughing, of course. Uh, plants without viable seed heads and their roots are an excellent source of nitrogen for a compost, so feel free to add those without those viable seeds. Um, placing mulch on top of your garden beds, as we talked about earlier, really helps to keep those unwanted plants out and keep that moisture in. It's a great reason to uh, do sheet mulching. Uh, inevitably, there will be some unwanted plants and the viable seed has come back from vacation. Everything sprouted up in the summer. That's what's happening, you know. Um, so unless you can ensure that your compost will reach a temperature of 50 degrees Celsius, um, 
you wouldn't want to put those seeds into your compost unless you want to be pulling those plants later. That same might, thing might go for squash. <laughs> if you add squash to your compost, you're going to get squash plants next year. Um, but that's okay. Maybe it's a great mulch, mulching plant. Um, so what to do with the seeds and the weeds when they, um, when they grow and they're out of control. You can do them, uh, you can break them down in a couple of different ways. You, and then you can still add them to the compost pile. So you can solar rose or tarp, and you place the plants on a tarp on the ground and add water. You cover them with a sheet of black or colored plastic and leave them in the sun. And eventually that material will turn into a brown slime. And once that has happened, you can add it to your compost pile. The garbage bag method is very similar. Fill half a bag, garbage bag with unwanted plants, add a small amount of water and garden soil, flip the garbage bag every other week for about eight weeks at least, um, until it turns into a nice brown sludge. Then add that to your compost. So you're heating, you're hitting those 50 degrees Celsius temperatures in those conditions of tarping or solarizing or the garbage bag. Uh, the other thing you can do is make a compost or weed tea. And um, you can follow the, the compost tea recipe mentioned on the next slide and do it with those unwanted plants. So plants with top roots such as dandelion and burdock are really high in nutrients. Okay. Um, and then they can turn into that bland, uh, brown sludge at the bottom of the bucket and you can add that to the compost pile. Last resort for noxious weeds, um, or sorry, I'm going to mention flame weeding first. If you feel very comfortable with this and you think it's safe, that is something that you could do to weaken a plant once, then you do it again the second time and you should be able to remove the plant. Um, that's going to be more ideal around things like non-flammable surfaces, um, concrete uh, pathways, stones, that kind of thing. So do some research on that, uh, but that is a non-toxic option for the soil. Uh, but yes, do your research. The last resort for noxious weeds, check the Ontario Ministry of Agriculture and Food a website. Um, they have a number of things listed there about certain plants, and um, that is your best resource and most up to date. Okay, so using compost. So depending on your method, in eight weeks to two years, that's a long range there, but um, you will have lovely finished compost to use on your plants and gardens. So some different ways to use your compost material. Uh, top dressing is a term used to describe layering a nutrient-rich substance on top of the soil around plants. Perennials are most often top dressed with compost in the early spring or early fall. Top dressing is a way to give plant roots a nutrient boost slowly over the course of three to six months. And when you top dress, it's a good idea to leave some space around the stems of the plants, about half an inch, or one to three centimeters, and that just ensures that if your compost is too rich, it won't burn the stem of the plants if, it has, um, if it's high in nitrogen. Uh, plant seedlings. Uh, is a great idea to understand the nutrient requirements of your seedlings. Um, for example, the curcubit family, cucumber, squash, melons, and the solanacea family, tomatoes, tomatillas, peppers, and most brassicas, broccoli, cauliflower, and cabbage are really heavy feeders um, so that they utilize a lot of nitrogen. So adding some compost to the, um, when you plant those seedlings can be really good. Um, and you mix in two or three shovelfuls of compost into the soil for each seedling and the compost should be mixed in well at the root zone or the area in which the seedling is to be planted. Direct sowing, so you're adding those seeds right into the soil and um, when it's warm enough and you start by digging a shallow trench where the seeds are to be placed and it's a great idea to put a small amount of compost in the trench before you sow those seeds. Seedling and potting mixes. There are several different schools of thought on seedling mixes. Some people feel that a sterile mix is the way to go to ensure that there are no problems with fungus, such as damping off. Uh, a second group of people feel strongly that compost is an important component of a seedling mix to give the growing seedlings a nutrient boost. So if you choose to use compost as a seedling mix, it is important that you add a material such as sand or perlite, which will allow for proper drainage. And there are several recipes for seedling mixes, but the easiest is one part compost to one part sand or perlite. And in potting mixes, you can add moss or guar. That will help retain water. Compost tea. So we mentioned that before. So an easy folk recipe for compost tea. Put a couple shovelfuls of finished compost into an old sock or nylon. Fill a large bucket or empty garbage pail with water. Make sure that you cover it, of course. We don't want 
uh, mosquitoes and uh, we don't want anyone else um, getting in there. So make sure you have something to cover it with. Um, and you stir your mixture for five minutes every day for two weeks. Uh, sorry, did I say you hang uh, the sock or the tea bag in the water with maybe an old clothes hanger or a stick? And then you stir it for five minutes every day for two weeks and then your tea is brewed. Use your tea directly on plants and plant leaves as a natural immune booster. And compost tea is particularly good at curing powdery mildew. Sorry, I had a little sneeze break there. Um, and it's also good to soak peas and beans in compost tea for 24 hours before sowing. It's a cool tip. And the other thing we mentioned before, compost tea can be a great compost activator. So you put your finished compost in, it's just enriched with billions of microbes per tablespoon and adding a shovel full or two into your compost pile can inoculate it with those wonderful microbes. Okay, so that's uh, the presentation, all of that information. I'm gonna go over just a couple of things here. Um, First and foremost, I didn't really mention it off the top, although they were listed there, but the Greater Victoria Compost Ed Education Center, uh, huge thanks to them. They shared their presentation a number of years ago when I first moved back to Ontario and started doing a few of these presentations. So a lot of this information um, was initially gathered for them and I've added to it over time, but a big thanks to them for all of the amazing work that they do to encourage composting and, and uh, researching it. Um, here are some resources. So I mentioned before that I helped to, uh, I created a lot of the composting content on the Brockton website. So www.brockton.ca slash compost. Uh, Bruce County also has um, some composting information. So brucecounty.on.ca slash composting. You can find a little pamphlet there with really like the Coles Notes version of this presentation. Uh, the Compost Education Center. So compost.bc.ca. Uh, their fact sheets uh, are amazing. So for each of these types of composters that I talked about, they have a fact sheet. If you want to build a three bin system out of pallets, there are instructions. So uh, it's an amazing resource. Uh, there is the Compost Council of Canada. It is uh, a little more industry focused. There are industrial compost uh, composters out there. Um, but there's still lots of great information. Uh, the book Guy's Garden by Toby Hemingway is not one that we have in our library, so I do make a special mention here because it's a great resource for our home gardeners and has a bit of a permaculture bent to it. Um, worm suppliers, there used to be a number I knew of around here. They are not here any longer, uh, but if you go to cityfarmer.org, use this address, um, you will find uh, some resources throughout the country, and this is uh, based in Vancouver City Farmers, but wormcomposting.ca is a, a private um, company, I believe, a worm farmer, and they're in the Waterloo region, so if you want to access worms, those are a couple of possibilities. And then I wanted to make a couple of library plugs because here we are with the library. Um, we have access in our collection to a number of ebooks. There are no audiobooks that relate to composting that I could find, but um, this is an app called Libby. If you haven't already checked it out with your library card, you can get access to ebooks and audiobooks through the library um, with this app on your sm smartphone or tablet. And these are three of the books that I found in uh, Quick Search. So um, really compost focused, but then you would get actually an ebook version on your device and you could flip through. Uh, I don't believe we have any of these ones in our physical collection here at the library. So um, these are great resources to check out. Uh, here are a couple of the books that we have in our collection. So Compost, The Natural Way to Make Food for Your Garden by Ken Thompson. Uh, Compost City is a, a newer release by Rebecca Louie. Uh, the Complete Idiot's Guide to Composting. You can't go wrong with these. Um, the Idiot's Guide books, they are quite basic and really lay it all out. Um, Grow Your Soil. So this is another one uh, by Diane uh, Meisler, and it's a newer one, and it's really talking about food web and the soil. I have not had a chance to read this book yet, but the illustration on the cover looks beautiful. Um, the Rodale Book of Composting, uh, this is a very uh, established in American Institute that has done a lot of research on organic methods and 
composting, soil health. So uh, they really have a, this is a newer version with new editors, I believe, and um, it's pretty comprehensive. So those are just a few of the resources we have in the library. Uh, because this is a recorded session, I'm not able to take any comments or uh, questions, but as I said, uh, feel free to leave comments in the comment section. And uh, as I have time, hopefully I can go ahead and answer a few questions. And um, we will look forward to trying to offer this again as well. So thank you for joining me. I hope you've learned a few interesting things and that you have a great season of composting ahead of you. Spring is here uh, in April of 2021, and um, it's pretty great to be outside and thinking about gardening. So thanks so much for joining us. Bye.